Okay, good afternoon again. And for those students from Vaughn College, you have a mission. Enrique is very interested in bringing five or six students down to Valaris this summer to work as interns. So your mission is to have Sharon DeVivo get in touch with me as soon as possible, and I'll help make those connections. Okay, congratulations. Thank you, Enrique. Enrique is the founder, chief executive officer, and member of the board of directors of Valeris. Valeris is an ultra low cost carrier that was founded in 2006. Enrique led Valeris to a successful IPO and its listing on both the Mexican Stock Exchange and the New York Stock Exchange. Today, Valeris has a market cap in excess of $1 billion. Enrique has also received many personal recognitions. He received the most significant award in Latin America's aviation industry, the Federico Block Prize, recognizing outstanding leadership. Enrique was named EY's Entrepreneur of the Year in Mexico in 2011, and he also received the National Order of Merit, Knight's Badge from the President of France. Please join me in welcoming Enrique Beltranina. Thank you very much. Good afternoon to everybody, okay? Thanks for having me here. Thanks for inviting me here for the board. It's a great pleasure. Um, and it's always a great pleasure to come to the Wings Club, okay, and, and, and share some of our thoughts. Um, let me start saying that what you may hear is a very different airline, okay? And, uh, and that's why this case is so interesting, okay? But um, sharing the amazing story of Volaris and its development in the last 10 years, it's, it's something which is, will probably uh, leave some messages here, okay? So it's an honor to tell that story of how we have overcome both commercial and geopolitical um, challenges and have made our dream a reality in these late years. As you may know, Volaris is Mexico's fastest growing airline. We operate a fleet of 82 Airbuses, A320s family, and we are traded both on the New York Stock Exchange and the Mexican Bolsa. As I will explain in a bit, um, while we have been inspired by the US low-cost carriers, we have taken their model a step further. We are an ultra low cost carrier and we compete with bosses as much as, or even more than we compete with airlines. While we proposed, um, while a proposed wall between the US and Mexico, the controversy of US-Mexico trade, escalation of violence has grabbed US news the real story and message I want to convey today is that our market holds promise and room for growth, and that Volaris is resilient and well positioned to address the challenges it faces. In the winter of 2017 and 2018, we realized that our world had changed. A new administration in the US would bring new changes in trade and immigration. In Mexico, Lopez Obrador held a significant lead in the polls to become the Mexican president, drawing into question the future of Mexico City's planned new international airport and foreshadowing other changes in Mexican economy. Moreover, oil prices had increased from $40 a barrel to $50 a barrel and the future cor curve showed us it could get to the 60s. We all know what happened, what followed, and what brought the current geopolitical and economic environment we live in right now. Facing potential adversity, we recognized that Volaris began a race against time. Reducing costs became our most important objective. And let me tell you where we were 
It's not that we were bad in, in terms of costs. We had a cost which was 5.6 cents ex fuel. So it was not that dramatic, okay? So reducing costs became our most important objective and we started to benchmark all over the world the best in class ultra low cost carriers and as a result we found more than 750 initiatives to cut costs across the entire company. The results of those initiatives generated more than $200 million of savings, which more than compensated for the rise in fuel costs during the same period, which we couldn't compensate through fares. These guys places Volaris as the second lowest unit cost operator in the world, first in the cost continent and in the Western Hemisphere. But why is this so important? Obviously, we had to honor our investors and produce best-in-class results. We wanted to honor our promise that everybody can fly in Mexico. We had to reduce our base fares to win our strategy against bosses. We had to become the new standard in aviation industry on digital commercialization and ancillary revenue generation. On the distribution side, we're very proud of our recent achievements. We developed such a digital system that people with very low income, very low education can purchase tickets. And it emulates the way people buy bus tickets. Low fares, low fares. Aviation in Mexico has been designed for elite and we wanted all Mexicans to fly. The solution was to design fares that were so cheap that would mobilize customers and get them out of town, obviously in a plane, and abandon the buses. We did it all through digital developments. We developed the concept of low base fares so people paid only for what they needed and nothing more. All additional services had to be bought separately because base fares have to compete with the boss pricing structure, okay? And not with services they are not interested or they cannot afford. As of today, we fly segments that equate to a boss journey time over five hours. And we beat the boss fares basically most of the time. We even had a simple discount scheme, not an expensive loyalty program, for our frequent tra travelers. Mexico's economic and geopolitical uncertainty has been part of the reality we had to deal with. But why has Volaris grown and not performed so well despite this uncertainty? Well, let me give you some amazing figures. Volaris operates in a market which in the past 10 years, we witnessed the downfall of 11 carriers. Nonetheless, Last year, we grew passengers by 19.5%. More impressively, 6 to 8% of our customers still claim to be first-time flyers. About one quarter of our customers still search bus fares first before purchasing tickets with Volaris, which means that after 14 years of our foundation, Bus companies remain our most important competitors. Therefore, when people ask us, what's your overlap with your competition on, on routes with other airlines? I like to remind them that on 41%, 41% of our routes, Volaris is the only airline competing against buses. So when we are benchmarking Volaris, we are comparing ourselves, not to the carriers we fly with, but obviously with the buses. We cannot compete ourselves versus carriers that have double our unit costs. And we are clearly that if we have the cost we have, we can outperform all other airlines price-wise. Air trips per capita went up from 0.25 in 2007 to 0.36 in 2018 in the Mexican market. 
We have grown the domestic market from 24 ma million passengers per year to 44 million passengers per year. The international market doubled in the same period to 42 million passengers per year. The result of all of this is that in the last 10 years, 48% of the market growth in Mexico is attributed to Olaris. The traffic volume in the domestic market continues to rise, in line with an emerging market economy in which the middle class continues evolving and demands more and more seats and air travel options, which is not the case of the business market. This trend explains part of Volaris's traffic behavior, where we see domestic demand of visiting friends and relatives grow much faster than the overall economy. This is an ideal fit for the ultra-low-cost model in this economy and population and the current size of the bus market in Mexico still indicates tremendous room for sustained growth. Think about it. Let me give you some numbers about the bus, the bus market. In 2006, an aviation market of 24 million passengers versus a bus market of 2 billion passengers. Now, that's 3.1 billion passengers. When you think about it, it's like a big balloon full of passengers, and we just had to poke it and capture 1% of those passengers, and by doing that, we could double the aviation market of the second largest economy in America. The emerging middle class, which is forecasted to be now 50% of the total population by the end of 2032, is comprised of low-income segments who have traditionally not flown. Additionally, we have a very young population. And guess what? We do have 34 million Mexicans in the US. So where are we today with this development in the domestic market? By the end of 2019, as a result of our strategy, we became the market leader in Mexico, surpassing Aeromexico. To give you a snapshot, today Volaris serves 188 routes to 65 destinations, plus more than 100 destinations in kosher with Frontier Airlines in the US. We have transported more than 120 million passengers in almost 14 years. And last year, we carried about 22 million passengers, becoming the largest ultra-low-cost carrier in Latin America, the largest domestic passenger operator in the Mexican market. We are 35% above our closest competitor and 6% higher in total traffic, which makes Volaris, as of December 31st of last year, the Mexican flagship carrier. Thank you, that's a tribute to those guys that work there. We now have a young fleet of 82 aircraft with an average age of 4.9 years and an average of 187 seats. It's important to mention that 28% of our fleet has new engines. During the last 12 months, we generated revenues of 1.7 billion US dollars, and from 2012 to 2019, our ASMs, here are these numbers, grew 2.3 times during the, the same period. Passengers also grew 2.5 times, and the revenues grew up 1.6 times, or 8% annually. A model that grows like this has certainly something different that makes the market excel, despite the uncertainty. We also can continue growing in an attractive emerging air travel market in Central America, continuing our geographic diversification through international growth and cultures. Our new culture arrangement with Frontier shows great promise, and we keep increasing our frequencies in very price elastic markets. I don't know if you realize how important this culture is in the industry, because it's the first time two low-cost carriers get together 
and have a kosher, which allows in the total territory to have low fares at the level of ultra low cost carriers do in each of the territories. We keep increasing our frequencies and you cannot imagine the elasticity of the markets. We have an upside in ancillary revenues, which now represents a third of our total revenues. And we have a very flexible fleet plan with high utilization. As a result, we can manage our capacity rationally. We still think we can improve Volaris to be the lowest cost operator in the world. Volaris has built a strong and diverse network with minimal concentration on one hub or overlap with other carriers. Our diversified network allows us to work around the infrastructure gaps and to grow consistently in on top opportunities throughout the Americas. Volaris today is flying 890,000 ASMs per aircraft per day, which is the highest utilization of any aircraft in the world. Another feature of Volaris is the fact that we only have 14% of the total seats which depart from Mexico City Airport. We are an airline which grew and achieved success without being dependent of any airport. Yes, we are concerned about the growth restriction in the metropolitan area, but we are an ultra low cost carrier and we are best suited to a point to point model and to adapt ourselves to secondary airports and the traffic around the new Santa Lucia Airport is much more of a fit to Volaris customers' profile. We will support the development of new paths for Mexico City Airport infrastructure every time. And just if it proves to be safe and a low cost alternative for our growth, if not, we will just continue growing in other geographies, which is the way we did it in the past. Central America is another avenue of growth for, for Volaris. In 2017, we began flying on a new airline operator certificate in Costa Rica, and we are also working to start one in El Salvador. Central America is also currently a very overpriced market, which as 14 years ago in Mexico, is limiting its growth. Today, a very small portion of our ASMs are operating in that area, but we're planning to extend our operation in the following years to maybe 22 to 25 aircrafts in the region. Another driver for our growth has been the fact that the most of our capacity is based in the northwestern area of Mexico. And here, let me try to explain you. Mexico is kind of a country of two countries, okay? It's, it's an economy which operates basically linked to the U.S. in the northern part of the, of the, of the country, and kind of a, a southern part of the, country, of the country operates more like Central America, okay? Why? Because of NAFTA. The, the northern part of Mexico developed in a very different way. So Volaris operates its vast majority of capacity there and is the leading airline in the States. Why? That have the highest GDP growth, highest volume of exports to the United States, highest employment growth, and highest remittances growth. So every time your president shrinks immigration, remittances go up. Guess what? We are the most effective transference of remittances to the country. We continue to be a great vehicle to transfer money from the US to our communities. How? The US people buy tickets for them and for their friends and relatives in Mexico. In a nutshell, we are the lowest unit cost operator in the Western Hemisphere. We have the best aircraft utilization in the world. We have the best digital system that uh, basically applies itself to, to a distribution that needs to be very simple to, because of the kind of customer we have. We're clean, transparent loafers, which are beating the bosses and obviously the airlines. We can continue growing because the bus market continues supplying us new traffic. We also can continue growing in an attractive emerging air travel market in Central America 
In the US, we have a great culture with a great partner, and our digital distribution systems are facilitating our ancillary revenue growth. We're in a geographical position where the Pemex impact is reduced, and our capacity is in regions that are pushing the growth of Mexico through the industries where the country performs better. But all in all, TRASM continues improving. Our unit revenue improved last year 9% versus 2018, and we transported, let me tell you, the largest number of passengers in the history of the country, and we believe that we can do that again and again in the following years. Let me return to costs. Our cost base, measured by cost per available seats, is something we are very proud. You laughed, it was 5.6 cents. Now it's 3.8 cents. US dollar cents per ASM X few at the end of the third quarter of 2019. To give you an idea, our TRASM is lower than the CASM of any airline in the continent in the Americas. I already said today we remain the airline with the lowest cost in the Western Hemisphere. We maintain rigorous controls. In fact, we painted our tails of our aircraft black to remind everybody that we can never go back to the dark side of the aviation, namely to provide air transportation to the wrong targets and with the wrong purposes. We wanted to let our people know that we are always ready to change and to adapt ourselves to the new trends. And this is why we have the Polaris start on our tails painted in pixels with modern colors of the Mexican architecture and guiding us always towards the north, the right target market that aviation should be targeting. During 2013, we took the company public as a fully registered company at the New York Stock Exchange and the Mexican Stock Exchange. Today, close to 65% of the company is publicly traded. And we all know what that means in terms of reporting, corporate controls, and transparency. Our total costs are so low that the fuel line represents 38%. The new aircraft and engine technology are key to manage our fuel costs. We were the first NEO operator in North America, and by today, NEOs make up 29% of our fleet. But by 2022, in two years from now, we will be almost 60% substituting by eco-friendly aircrafts, the engines of which burn less fuel, and they also equipped with Charlotte technology on its wings, which also helps us to reduce even further the fuel burn. All in all, when we finish the transition of our fleet, we'll have achieved an average of 19% lower fuel consumption on that line, which is so important for us, which also favors our move to become the number one lowest cost operator in the world. Our ties to the Indigo Group have brought us operational synergies and the global perspective they bring to the table, plus the purchasing power of a very large group while negotiating. I want to be clear. Our objective as a group is always to strive for the lowest price, but to achieve this, we do not sacrifice safety, quality, nor on-time delivery. As a matter of fact, airlineratings.com just named Volaris among the top five safest low-cost airlines in the world. I want to emphasize that this concept applies to all of our suppliers, and I want to say it very clear, it also applies to the airports. All of our fleet is leased, and we manage our total cost of ownership through competitive acquisition costs low lease rates, and a continuous life cycle management of each aircraft, which optimizes the maintenance expense and operating cost of each aircraft. We have incorporated predictive maintenance programs, which increase the dispatch reliability of our aircraft to levels that had never been dreamed in Latin America. Volaris strategy 
is aimed not only at improving the performance of the business, but we are also supporting and protecting the environment. Polaris monitors fuel burn very closely, not only because of economic part, uh, impact, which is obviously very important for us, but also because it's better to be greener. In 2018, we saved 32.5 million gallons of jet fuel versus the industry average fuel burn per RPM. In 2019, we saved another 15.8 million gallons of jet fuel versus our fuel burn in 2018. So now we are the greenest airline from Mexico to Alaska. We achieved this not only by having more NEO aircraft, but also by increasing awareness amongst our pilots, crews, and everybody in the company, reducing use of APUs, optimizing trajectories, and burning less fuel, amongst other initiatives. But think about it. This is the equivalent to saving more than 314 kilotons of CO2, or the equivalent of the emissions of more than 60,000 passenger vehicles driven in a year. The savings can also be translated in almost 2,000 acres of preserved land. Even more, in, since 2012, Volaris has reduced 18% its CO2 emissions per RPM, and this is equivalent to 1.3 million tons of CO2, more than 250,000 passengers' vehicle driven per year. You can take that little lady that's all around the world, we're doing that. As in to Greta, as industry leaders, we have the responsibility to make Volaris the greenest airline in Mexico. All our operations are aligned into the UN Sustainable Development Goals, and I will give you some examples of that. We voluntarily report our yearly greenhouse gas emissions to Corsia, the carbon offsetting and reduction scheme for international aviation. We also do that to the local Mexican authority. Every year, we make a voluntary self-assessment with the Mexican Stock Exchange, the Bolsa Mexicana de Valores, of our sustainable maturity that addresses our corporate governance management, our social, economic, and environmental performance. All these initiatives have played us in their sustainable index, which is equivalent to what Dow has now in Mexico for the last four years. Polaris strives to be a strong and reliable partner to its suppliers. We are committed to delivering safe and sustainable growth and encouraging the development of a robust safety and operational infrastructure. We maintain close communications with our regulators throughout the region and in the US and support initiatives that raise the bar of aviation safety. Our growth and the confidence of our consumers depend on our taking a proactive and cooperative approach to safety, which is the backbone of our business. Now, let me finish by saying this. Volaris has delivered what is probably the best financial performance ratios of any airline in this continent. We know that our investors are concerned about uncertainty relating to Mexico, but we have shown resiliency and the ability to pivot in the face of adversity. But there are some things I can promise to you. First, we will strive to sustain our cost position as the lowest unit cost operator in the Western Hemisphere, and we'll strive to become number one in the world. We will continue deploying capacity in a rational way, but we are prepared to capitalize on important opportunities in our emerging markets, and we'll continue excelling on the bus switching passengers and targeting the Mexican middle class. We will protect the growth of our total unit revenue, clearly not through maintaining the base fare high, but increasing them, and then compensating with other components the equation to make an improved TRASM every year. We will preserve and sustain our strong cash position, and we will work very hard to continue 
generating a very high ROIC to our investors at similar or better ratios than 2019. These are very strong promises, which is the reason to continue investing in a company like ours. And I will continue leading the transportation of this great industry in the regions we fly, because there we think we are pioneers. Let me finish by thanking the Wings Club for this opportunity to talk to all of you. Thank you, our investors, our members of the board, that we have two members of our board thing, sitting here, Harry Krensky and, and, uh, and, uh, and John, please, could you say, wave, okay? My partners and the Volaris family for their confidence in our execution. Over and above, the personal achievements I'm horror to play a part in the development of our countries and communities. Now, can I ask you something? Can we give this fabulous industry, the aviation industry, a viva? Viva! Are there any questions for Enrique? I, mean, I think that was a very uh, one of the most passionate speeches we've had in uh, in many years. Thank you, Enrique. Any questions? Yeah. Oh, look at this. Here we go. Dave, quick question. First of all, Enrique, terrific speech, and congrats on your great success. Thanks, Jeff. I'm curious. When you started, as I recall, that success wasn't as obvious. It's been a difficult road. When you look at where you are today and where you started. What were the major surprises that, when you look back, you didn't expect, either positive or negative? I would say on the positive side, Jeff, is I never thought that switching passengers from buses to aviation was going to be basically a continuous thing. I mean, we can't stop it, and, and, and it's, it keeps on asking for capacity and keeps on asking for, 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 for more flights and for more routes and for more things. And, and, and I thought that the hat was going to have a limit and by no means. It has no limit. It's like that big balloon that I was explaining, okay, and it's, it's, it's amazing, okay. That's the first thing. The, the second thing is I, I think when we spoke about a model like this, changing buses, bus passengers to, was going also to be something which, which was a great adventure. I mean, Gol had tried it in Brazil, and they changed the model, and they purchased Varic, and everything went away. <laughs> but um, um, I honestly don't think that um, we were going to construct a company. I, I mean, remember I come from TACA, and, 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 and when I was in TACA, we had 32 aircrafts, and we thought we were the kings of the market in Central America. We thought it was going to be a 30, 32 aircraft uh, airline. Now it's, it's uh, I mean, in five years, we'll be 150 aircraft, okay? So um, I think what we're finding is that the company uh, and the model is, is not exhausting, and, and it's really changing. And then the other thing which I think it's really important, it goes clearly with you, is I think producing the cost we are producing would not be able, we would never be able unless we had the technology we have. I mean, we couldn't see that technology coming and we couldn't see the technology being implemented. I mean, what we're seeing now, I mean, if you would have asked me, I mean, how are the news two years ago, I would say, well, we're struggling and and you know my story, okay, better than anyone here, okay? But now we do have the NEOs operating and, 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 uh, and it's, I mean, I remember some years ago when I came to Wings and I said it's like a donkey working in the mountain and, and pulling up stones and pulling up, I mean, it's like that. I mean, we're, we're now being able to get some reliability of the fleet and, and, and stabilizing the, the fleet in general, thanks to Pratt too, okay? And, uh, and uh, this is something important because what we're seeing here is there's a future 
And it's this change of technology that we saw, which is a quantical change of technology. I mean, what we saw in terms of engines and, and, and uh, fuel burn and everything from the fleets in the last years, um, it's amazing. And, and, and that's what's producing this cost. I mean, if, if we think about it, I mean, five years ago, we couldn't think about the cost like this, OK? And Eresha probably says the same, OK? which is the lowest cost of brain in the world. Yes, sir. The question is on, on the bus customers that you're attracting. Uh, have you done any uh, market research on uh, retain, retaining them? How many, you know, roughly what percentage of the people who come off of the bus and fly in Volaris ever go back to the bus? Or how many, how, how uh, what's, what's your attention on them? It's, it's, they basically stay with us. I mean, that's what we have surveyed, okay? It's amazing. I mean, there's an Australian economist that speaks uh, about uh, this phenomenon of, of moving people from, from buses to, to aircraft. And he says, it's amazing to look at these people because they kind of become middle class. I mean, it's a quantical shift for them to, to, to move away from, from buses and that kind of transportation and then become uh, airline people and, and flying people. And uh, what happens is they stay very loyal to our system, especially, and it's, it's not just because we have the system and the fares. I mean, there's also some, another airline that does that. It's because of the distribution system, okay? The distribution system makes it so simple for them that uh, they end up sticking to us. Hi, I'm Mike Lavitt with Aviation Week. Yes, Mike. Uh, considering the problems that Boeing is having with the MAX, some people are questioning whether it's wise for an airline to rely on a single pipe in its fleet. Um, what, what do you think of, is, is it a good idea for LCCs to think about diversifying? Look, I mean, I'm a, I am a real believer, real believer of one single fleet. I mean, this business, when you go to ultra low cost carrier, level of costs, standardizing, is of the essence. I mean, you cannot have mechanical licenses for everybody. You cannot have, um, uh, I don't know, I mean, pilots with different licenses and this kind of stuff. I mean, the complexity is the worst thing that you can generate in a business like ours, OK? Um, I am, I, if, you, if you think about me when I am in the company, they, everybody speaks about how I kill complexity, OK? And, uh, and uh, I am always behind everybody, so they, they really make uh, complexity disappear. And, and having two fleets, yes, it diversifies, and in a problem like the one we are living, it's probably a great thing. But believe me, the problem we are living, it's once in I don't know how many times, and, and, and then you, you have to continue living, and you have to continue making the company perform. So, so I'm a firm believer of standardizing. I fight for standardization. I mean, ask the, the Pratt people, I mean, how much I fought uh, for standardization in our engines and, 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 uh, and the way we operate, OK? And uh, it's a day-to-day -day thing, because otherwise you destroy your cost equation. So rather than asking Pratt, Pratt is going to ask a question. <laughs> yeah, uh, real quick. First of all, I do want to echo Dave's thanks. Your offer to sponsor students from Vaughan College is wonderful, and it ties right in. With, you know, Wings Club Foundation is all about connecting aviation leaders and supporting the future generations, and you've done that both here today, so thank you. Thanks, Mary. Um, and then I, I do want to get political for a minute. Uh, you mentioned President Obrador, uh, you know, in power now, new administration, which is a fair amount left than the previous Mexican administration. There was some concern about that. How has that played out? Has there been an impact on aviation, on the economy in general, attributable well, to the administration? Let me start with the first one. I, I think it's a great pleasure doing this with the students, and I think we all should be doing this because we need the people to practice. I mean, the problem we have is we have great schools, but then they come out that they, they don't have the practice first. The second thing is we need the US universities to send people to our countries because they, they, they help us to upgrade our people. So, so it's a great interchange, and I'm really willing to do it, and really willing to do it on an ongoing basis. So, so that's great. Lopez Obrador. I think um, it's a change, definitely. I mean, 
as it has been for the states Trump, okay? And um, it's a different way of seeing life, it's a different way of working, it's a different uh, way of relating yourselves with the governments. We airlines are, are, are concessions from the government, so, so we need to work with the governments, whether we like it or not, and, uh, and uh, it has to be like that. Let me tell you, I think there's, there's two or three things that are important with Lopez Obrador, okay? The first one is, he is very conscious about how much he's spending, okay? Which is a difference versus the traditional pre-governors of the 70s and the 80s, okay? Um, and uh, he has kind of managed not to spend uh, humongous amounts of money, okay? The second, which is good, because on one side, we, we all are kind of hysterical looking at the economy and what it could happen with the economy, but, but on the other side, at least he's not spending that bad, okay? Some decisions have been really difficult, um, and, and I'm very clear that the airport decision was a very difficult decision and uh, impacted a lot of investors and this kind of stuff and the confidence of investing in Mexico, okay? Um, he's managed through it. Um, the airport was uh, a symbol of his campaign as the wall was a symbol of Trump's campaign, okay? And we won't have an airport, I'm sorry. I mean, whomever is still thinking that we'll have the Texcoco airport is, is really dreaming, okay? So, but let's put that on the other side. It's a great opportunity. It's an opportunity for us to redefine the traffic to the metropolitan area. And it's an opportunity for companies that are open to fly, especially like com companies like us, who are ultra low cost carriers and fly point to point, okay? So the way I see it, it's a great opportunity for Volaris, okay? And um, as I said, provided that it is a uh, safe and low cost, all for it, we'll play for it. And the traffic around that area is very much the traffic Volaris flies. So we can work with that. <coughs> There's all another two issues that people think about Lopez Obrador. When I, I mean, I spent the whole day in the market yesterday in a roadshow, in a non-deal roadshow with our investors. And, and they immediately asked me about Pemex, okay? And yes, I mean, the Pemex issue is big because it weights, the depth of Pemex weights so much on the depth of the country that um, it's delicate if, if, if something happens. If you would have asked me 30 days ago, I, will, I was very concerned of what it could happen with Pemex. But at the beginning of the year, the government launched two issuance of bonds and they were kind of, uh, they, they were very well received and, and they were placed and that solves the problem in a large extent for this year. So Fitch has already um, uh, moved down the, the, the rating of the debt. Moody's has, done, has not done it and I think it well could be that they don't do it, okay? What, why is this important because the third derivative of this is if Pemex blows the debt, the credit blows in the country and then consumer doesn't have how to purchase. So, so we are part of the third derivative, which is consumers and how consumers can keep on purchasing or consuming this year. And I, I'm seeing it kind of sustainable for the next 12 months. So, in general, what I'm trying to say is um, we still have doubt. It's kind of controlled. Uh, but within that, for Volaris, we have been managing it very well and we have not been affected in terms of consumption. And we can keep on growing the way we are growing this year. And we will. Okay? So that helps you guys to understand where we are. Okay? Well, thank you, Enrique. Thank you. Please stay here. A couple of gifts for you. First, this plaque to commemorate today's speech presented to Enrique Beltranina. 
and grateful appreciation for your presentation at the Aviation Leader Series of the Wings Club Foundation in New York, January of 2020. That's Thank first. Thanks, Danny. And then our third volume, the 25 years of Trials and Triumphs, 1992 to 2017. We just published this last year. So wow, please, good much. reading, uh, an interesting story of thank you. the Wings Club. And if you don't mind, you will do the